I stuck in an order for a Raspberry Pi 5 the minute I saw the announcement. Unfortunately, I missed the deadline for the first batch of publicly available pies by about 20 minutes. So I had to wait for the second batch to be shipped, which was very frustrating and it took a long time. I wanted to know how the Pi 5 stacks up against its predecessors for that most important of workflows, emulating an Atari ST using Hatari. My Pi arrived eventually and opening the box I have a Pi 5 and an official cooler. And a little while later I bought the official power supply because the one I used on my old Pi 4 kept giving me undervoltage warnings and I was worried that that would affect performance. So laying out our three test devices, here's the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, the Pi 4 and the Pi 5. I want to try emulating the entire range of Atari computers, the ST, the Falcon and the TT. And for each Pi, I'll stop testing when the emulation performance is unacceptable. Since nobody wants to see a machine that runs molasses slow. So what constitutes acceptable and unacceptable performance? I'm glad you asked. Hatari by default prioritizes CPU and hardware emulation over screen refreshes using a technique called frame skipping. With frame skipping, Hatari will stop rendering the screen for a number of frames to allow the hardware emulation to keep in sync. And you can set this manually or you can have the emulator automatically calculate it. For our tests, we'll set the frame skip to auto and just let Hatari decide what to do. Keep an eye on the frame skip value down there on the status bar as I run the emulator on various pies. A frame skip of zero is perfection. The emulator is emulating all the hardware, all the device features and outputting the screen without having to drop any frames. A frame skip of one, especially in mono mode on Atari's, is to me acceptable. Remember, this is all highly subjective. After all, that mono mode operates at about 71 hertz. So a frame skip of one gives you about 35 frames a second of update, which for me, for productivity apps is acceptable. But anything over one leads to very poor screen updates. And for me, that really isn't acceptable. Our first device is the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. Now that plus is important. The original 3B has not got the chops to emulate anything. So this Pi was released in 2018, so quite some time ago. They're still on sale today and you can pick one up for about £40 in the UK. Hardware wise, the 3B Plus has a 64-bit Broadcom system on a chip. That's an ARM V8 based Cortex A53 and that runs at 1.4 gigahertz. And that's paired with one gigabyte of 800 megahertz LPDDR2 memory. So let's have a look at game emulation first. So here, I'm running the Bitmap Brothers Xenon 2. And as you can see, we're getting a very solid frame skip over zero. Now, I'm not gonna show gameplay here as there's a reason this isn't an Atari gaming channel. I'm pretty rubbish at playing them. So let's move on to desktop and productivity. So let's run up NeoDesk and Geneva in color mode. So straight away, I think you can see the frame skip is unacceptable at two. But I, I guess if all you have is a Pi 3B+, plus, then you might get by, I don't know. And in mono mode, it's absolutely hopeless. It's running at the max frame skip of five, so the underlying emulation is probably suffering really badly. So what's the conclusions for the 3B+, plus? Uh, good for ST gaming, pretty useless otherwise. And if all you're interested in is gaming, crack on. Onwards and upwards to the Pi 4. Now the Pi 4 was released in 2019, so only a year after the 3B+. It has an ARM V8 based Cortex A72 running at 1.8 gigahertz. And it came in one, two, four, or eight gigabyte variants. And it had 3,200 megahertz of LPDDR4 memory. I could have just said 3.2 gigahertz, couldn't I? Never mind. Now this is still being sold, starts at 35 quid for the one gig model and up to 75 pounds for the eight gigabyte model. I'm gonna skip playing games because the 3B handled that easily. So there's no point in reproducing that. So let's start with NeoDesk and Gemini. Here we have perfect emulation with a frame skip of zero, which is nice. So what about mono mode? Here the Pi 3B capped the max frame skip out, but here on the Raspberry Pi 4, this is also perfect. Shall we ratchet up the pressure on the Pi, shall we? So the Mega ST was an interesting piece of hardware. It was the first of the ST line that broke 
with the 8 MHz CPU speed limit. It was switchable between 8 MHz for compatibility and 16 MHz for raw power. And let's have a quick look at this running on the Pi 4 and see if having to emulate that 16 MHz 68000 affects the emulator. And no, it doesn't. We have a rock solid frame skip of zero. So, whew, flush with success, let's push on to the Falcon. Now the Falcon represents another step change for the emulator as it has a more complicated 68030 processor running at the same 16 megahertz as the Mega STE. So running in Falcon mode, the Pi 4 performed adequately. It had a frame skip of, well, it oscillates between zero and one over time. So that's not too shabby at all. If I were using this, I think I'd probably pin the frame skip to one just to make it consistent. So if that's relatively adequate, let's see what the TT gets us. So here the processor remains as an 030, but the clock speed doubles again to 32 megahertz. And yep. That's a hot mess with the frame skip pegged at five again. So we've absolutely reached the limit for the Pi 4. So no TT support here. So in conclusion for the Pi 4, perfect for any of the ST line, including the Mega STE and adequate for Falcon emulation. Right, finally, the new kid on the block, the Pi 5. The Pi 5, it has an ARM V8 based Cortex A76 processor running at 2.4 gigahertz. And it comes with either 4 or 8 gigs of 4.267 gigahertz LPDDR4X memory. So while it's only running at approximately 0.6 of a gigahertz faster than its predecessor and memory that's clocked at 1.3 times the Pi 4, it does perform way faster than the Pi 4. Uh, it has faster networking, SD card access, things like that, faster video. And while I haven't mentioned any benchmarks in this video, because obviously we're concentrating on frame skip on Hatari, one interesting measurement that I did do was that compiling Hatari on the Pi 5 took 8 minutes and 45 seconds, whereas on the Pi 4 it was 19 minutes dead. So actually, for all it's only somewhat faster in CPU speeds, it's almost twice as fast in actual computation. So the prices for the Pi 5 is 60 quid for a 4 gig model and 80 for an 8 gig version. But at the time of making this video, which is December 2023, stock is unavailable and units are currently back on pre-order. Let's get to the emulation. I'll skip the ST line completely and start where the Pi 4 hit adequate and that's the Falcon. As you can see when emulating the Falcon, the Pi has zero frame skip. That's very impressive. By the way, if you're looking at the graphics here and thinking the banding on the screen is pretty rubbish, that's a combination of my video capture card and the fact that the status bar changes the screen layout and kind of aspect ratio. So I'm just quickly going to remove the status bar and you'll actually see it's rendering really well. So how can we further torture the Pi 5? Let's try Videl graphics and put the resolution up to 992 by 752 pixels with lots of colors. By the way, I'll put a link up there to a video I did on Videl graphics previously. It's an interesting watch. And here we have a frame skip of well, zero again. So well played, Pi 5. Okay, ratcheting up again. Uh, let's try the TT. Now remember this has a 32 megahertz processor, twice the speed of the Falcon, twice the burden on the CPU of the Pi. As you can see, the TT has a vastly larger screen than the ST had. So one side effect of that is, of course, that we're sloshing a lot more pixels around. And looking at it, we have a consistent frame skip of one. So the conclusion is, the Pi 5 is perfect for the Atari ST line, the Mega ST, Falcons, and it's adequate for TT emulation. It is worth noticing at this point that it's still really early days for the Pi 5, and OS updates are bringing performance improvements for areas like video processing on a regular basis. And also, it's not exactly an apples for apples test with the Pi 4, because I had to run Atari full screen on top of a window manager on the Pi 5, because there's a bug in the SDL2 libraries that prevented me from running it standalone from the boot prompt. So I think there's definitely more performance available here. Now, so far, I've never used overclocking on any of these Pis. I mean, after all, the warranty that comes with the Pi says it's voided if you overclock it, and poof, we wouldn't want that, would we? But since this is a video about the Pi 5, I think we'll try it and see what we get. But as they say, don't try this at home, kids. So I overclocked my Pi to a CPU frequency of 3 GHz and a GPU frequency of 1 GHz. And frankly, the performance was pretty much the same with a frame skip of 1. So, so much for that then. Actually, I've seen plenty of posts saying this was a stable configuration. 
But for me, the Pi behaved very badly at this speed. I had UI freezes, random shutdowns, you name it. So I've backed the changes out and I'll accept a TT with a frame skip of one. Until the next Pi, that is. So in conclusion then, from the Pi 3B Plus to the 5, it's been a steady improvement. Generation after generation of Pis enabling generation after generation of Ataris to be emulated. The Pi 5 isn't quite there yet for emulating the TT, but for all other purposes, it's a really great device for Atari emulation and I would recommend it. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon.